Okay, today I'm going to do a smaller version and perhaps address a couple of things that I didn't address in the longer in the longer discussion on belief number 20, the Sabbath. So this is a shorter talk on belief number 20, fundamental belief number 20 of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The gracious creator, after the six days of creation, rested on the seventh day and instituted the Sabbath. So we read about this in the beginning of Genesis chapter 2. For all people as a memorial of creation. Okay, so we see that when we read the book of Exodus 28 through 11, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy six days. You shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. So the Sabbath is to be different from all the other days. If you're working the same way you would on any other day on the Sabbath, you're not keeping the Sabbath. The Sabbath is to be set aside. Six days you labor and do all your work. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son, your daughter, manservant, maidservant, cattle, stranger within your gates. For in six days, the Bible says, God created heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and you rested on the seventh day. Therefore, you blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So this is what we're talking about. The fourth commandment of God's unchangeable law, I'm continuing reading here, requires the observance of this seventh day as the day of rest, worship, and ministry in harmony with the teaching and practice of Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a day of delightful communion with God and one another. It is a symbol of our redemption in Christ, a sign of our sanctification. Uh, Exodus 31, 13 mentions the Sabbath as a sign. Also, we see a sign is a seal when we look, for example, at Romans 4, 11. So the Sabbath is a sign and a seal. We are also sealed with the Holy Spirit, according to Ephesians 1, 13 and 4, 30. But let me continue. You could learn more on that in the longer talk about the sign and, and seal. A token of our allegiance and a foretaste of our eternal future in God's kingdom. The Sabbath is God's perpetual sign of his eternal covenant between him and his people. Again, you can see there Exodus 31, 13 to 17, which I spoke briefly in reference to verse 13. So the Sabbath is a perpetual sign of his eternal covenant between him and his people. Joyful observance of this holy time from evening to evening, sunset to sunset, is a celebration of God's creative and redemptive acts. So when you read the book of Genesis chapter 1 and you be, read about creation, it tells us evening, morning, the first day, evening, morning, the second day. So the day begins at sundown, the evening. That's when the day begins. So the Sabbath begins on Friday night, and it ends on Saturday at sundown. So Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, that is the biblical Sabbath. It is a time of convocation, coming together according to Leviticus 23 and verse 3. Now you can read these um, references here for further study. I'm not going to get into all of that now. This is a, a much shorter discussion on the Sabbath. Why does the Sabbath matter? The Bible does reveal that the Sabbath is also an end time issue. When we look at the first angel's message in Revelation 14, 6 and 7, the first angel having the everlasting gospel proclaimed to all those who dwell on earth, every tribe, tongue, and nation. 
declaring with a loud voice, fear God, give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that created the heavens, the earth, the sea. Stop right there. Language directly taken from the fourth commandment, Exodus 28 through 11, which tells us in six days. So not only is the Sabbath an end time issue, but the six day creation is. And it is a very popular teaching, a very popular idea that you can be a Christian. And I'm not saying you can't because only God can weigh to Moses' the heart. Only God understands the heart. But the idea is it is not inconsistent with the Bible to deny six day creation. You can believe in millions of years. You can believe in theistic evolution. You can believe in things that are contrary to what the Bible teaches. Now, only God knows the sincerity to the heart of the believer, but evolution is not consistent with the Bible. The millions of years for creation are not consistent with the Bible. The Bible describes six-day creation. And the six-day creation is referred to in the Sabbath commandment. And in my previous talk, in my previous talk on belief number 18, I explained how 1844 was an important year in prophecy, that the 2300 evenings and mornings of Daniel 814 began 457 and end 1844. And I explained that in my longer discussion and also in the shorter one a little bit on fundamental belief number 18. And there is also information on that in my series on spiritual Israel and the new earth. But 1844, an important year of prophecy, the, the year when the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus, our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, Hebrews 8, 1. Jesus, our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. Entered into that second apartment phase of his ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. The heavenly day of atonement. 1844. Well, it is interesting that 1844 was also the year when Darwin put together his essay. He put together the foundational ideas and wrote them out that would later be developed into his book on the origin of the species evolution, concerning evolution. So 1844 was an important year for an attack on this foundational teaching of creation, which is referred to in the Sabbath commandment. And so when we look at that first angel's message, and also when we look at the third angel's message, which reveals in Revelation 14:12. This is the patience of the saints. These are those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. That God's remnant church, that God's end time people will keep the commandments of God, including the Sabbath. And we have that direct language in that first angel's message. Fear God, give him glory. Worship him that created the heavens, the earth, the sea, when are we supposed to worship him? Now, we're always supposed to worship him all the time. Whatever you eat, drink, whatever you do, do to the honor and glory of God, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. But there is a day, a day that was set aside that acknowledges God as the creator and that he created in six days. That is the Sabbath. The Sabbath is an end time issue because there's going to be a counterfeit law, a counterfeit gospel, and a counterfeit Sabbath. There already is the counterfeit Sabbath of Sunday, 
but there will come a time when Sunday becomes the mark of the beast. See, right now, there are many people that are keeping Sunday. Only God could weigh the motives of the heart. The full work of the three angels' message and the loud cry has not yet been completed. But as that work, as the knowledge of truth goes all over the world concerning the everlasting gospel, concerning the law of God, the three angels' message, concerning the Sabbath, people will have no excuse. And God knows who is receiving the truth and who will come to the knowledge of the Sabbath and be convicted of it. And he also knows who will resist the truth. Because there's a difference between somebody who is keeping Sunday and keeping it in ignorance and doesn't know any better and God knows the motives of the heart, Proverbs 16, 2 and 21, 2. But there's also those who may be keeping Sunday and resisting the truth and building upon silly and unbiblical arguments to keep Sunday. Now, somebody might say, well, is the resurrection a silly argument? No, the, the resurrection is, is a, a essential, an in essential ingredient of the gospel message, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and also his ministry as high priest. But the resurrection does not equal a change to the Sabbath, and that is where the mistake is made. That is where the mistake is made, to say the resurrection equals changing the Sabbath. The Bible does not teach that. In fact, it's interesting because in John 11:11, 11, 11, Jesus referred to Lazarus being in the grave as being as sleeping, as sleeping. When we think of sleeping, we think of resting. Well, Jesus rested in the grave on the Sabbath. He rose again on the first day of the week as Matthew 28 and verse 1 reveal. And the first day of the week has been celebrated in tradition as the day of the resurrection of Jesus, Easter Sunday. And the Bible is saying he resurrected on the first day of the week, according to Matthew 28 and verse 1. But the Sabbath is an end time issue because there's going to be a final conflict. And there's going to be a final conflict between a false gospel, a false law, a false Sabbath. And when we look at the mark of the beast in Revelation 13, that people would be pressured to accept this mark on the hand or on the forehead. On the hand or on the forehead. It reminds us, that language reminds us of language we see in Deuteronomy 6.8. In Deuteronomy 11.18, that the law of God was to be a sign on the hand and on the forehead. Also, the keeping of the unleavened bread the redemption of the firstborn, the ordinance connected with the Passover was to be, and that language used, a sign on the hand and the forehead in the book of Exodus 13, 9 and 13, 16. And the Passover, as I explained in the longer version of this talk, the Passover is a reminder of the gospel. And so that language of being on the head and on the hand, the sign on the head and on the hand, indicates how the gospel is to influence how we think and what we do. The law of God, through the power of Christ, we can keep the law of God, as I explained in my talk on belief number 19. So through the power of Christ, we can be lawful. We will have the patience of the saints that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, Revelation 14, 12. It is through the power of Christ, through the power of Christ, through the power of Christ, not our own might nor power, but by the Holy Spirit. It is the power of Christ that enables us to keep the law of God. So, it is the Holy Spirit it is the Holy Spirit that glorifies Christ. If we look at those wonderful Holy Spirit passages in the book of John 16, from 13 to 15, the Holy Spirit would glorify 
Christ. And we look at those Holy Spirit passages and the Bible then tells us in Ephesians 1.13 and 4.30, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. So if you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, you're going to have the gospel. The gospel is going to influence the way you think and what you do. You're going to keep the law of God. And you're going to keep the Sabbath, which is also a sign. And a sign is a seal, as we see the language of Romans 4.11. Again, more on this in my longer talk. But then we read in Revelation 13 of the joining, the union between the beast of the earth, the beast of the sea, and the dragon is also mentioned early on in Revelation 13. So there's going to be this threefold union. And as a result of that union, the beast of the earth, and again, beast is kingdom, and I don't want to go into too much detail on that now. But this beast of the earth, and I say beast is kingdom, and you could see that, and I just said that, so I'll just tell you the reference in Daniel 7, 17, and 23. But this final union that we look at, and out of that is going to come the mark of the beast, the mark, the Greek word charagma, a sign of allegiance to the beast. And it says that the person can receive it on their hand or on their forehead. Now, the seal of God is on the forehead, we see in Revelation chapter 7. We see from these, these symbolic ordinances and symbolic language of Revelation 13 that I spoke of, and also concerning the law being on the hand and the forehead, that God's people are to be conscious in their forehead, in their minds, the, the seat of conscience, the frontal lobe, um, we are to be conscious. We are to understand what we are doing. But with this mark of the beast, it could be on the hand or on the forehead. So some are going to go along, and, and Satan doesn't care. Some are going to go along and to receive the mark of the beast on the hand. He doesn't care. See, God cares because the word of God says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And in Romans 12, 2, it says, Be not conformed to the world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you might prove that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So God cares about what you know, and you shall know the truth, according to John 8, 32. So 8, 32, and Romans, uh, so John 8, 32, and Romans 12, 2, and God is reasonable, Isaiah 1, 18, so God cares that and, and wants his people to understand in their minds and for us to be influenced in our acts. But the devil doesn't care. So whether or not someone goes along with the mark of the beast and receives the mark of the beast because they want to follow, because they want to keep their job, maybe they don't believe in the agenda of the beast, but they go along with it to keep their job or, what, or because of social pressure, or they actually believe and have fully embraced mentally the agenda of the beast. The Bible is clear. When we look at that language, it is a direct response. It is a direct link to the language that was to be applied to the law of God, to the gospel, as is symbolized by the Passover. And the seal of God, as we are reminded in Revelation 7. And so those who are sealed with the Holy Spirit are going to keep the commandments of God, going to keep the true Sabbath, going to, going to have the everlasting gospel, while those who receive the mark of the beast are going to have a counterfeit gospel. Uh, perhaps a gospel of legalism. Perhaps a gospel of anything goes. Oh, God loves you. Don't be judgmental. You know, we want to have a safe church, and what we mean by that is we don't want to uphold any standards or any doctrines even though the Word of God tells us in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 that the Word of God is there for doctrine and for correction. And Paul was concerned with the doctrine as we see in Romans chapter 16 and verse 17, those who broke and went against the doctrine. So doctrine is essential. But there are those who will receive this false gospel Perhaps a false gospel of anything goes, but the Bible describes it as a form of godliness, but denying the power 
thereof. And you could read more on that in 2 Timothy chapter 3, in the beginning of that chapter. So, we also see from Exodus 31.13 that the Sabbath is a sign, and as I said, Romans 4.11, a sign is a seal. So those are the seal of God, and a time is going to come. Now, as I said, right now, that threefold union hasn't happened yet. That mark of the beast hasn't been enforced. Now, according to what we read in Revelation 13, there are going to be civil penalties. There is going to be an economic penalty. So this requires a worldwide centralized economy. Contrary to capitalism and decentralization of the market and the free market, there's going to be a centralized economic system. When we look somehow worldwide to be able to control who can buy and sell all over the world so that there will be an economic persecution on those who do not receive the mark of the beast on the hand or the forehead. Now, if the, when we look at these things, if we see that the seal of God, ultimately the Holy Spirit seals us, but we see that those who are sealed will keep the commandments of God, have the testimony of Jesus Christ, keep the law of God, keep the commandments of God, have the everlasting gospel, those who have the seal of God, obviously will keep the Sabbath. So the truth will be spread all over the world. That three angels message that we read about in Revelation 14, the loud cry, Revelation 18, the truth will go out. Everyone will have the opportunity to make the choice. But then we read in Revelation 13 of a death decree. A death decree. And so before that final wind of strife is let go, we see in Revelation 7, God's people will be sealed. They will be prepared. And so if the seal of God is the things that I mentioned, then the mark of the beast is the counterfeit. So there's going to be a counterfeit law. There's going to be a counterfeit gospel. It's going to be intoxicating. When we look at the image of Revelation 17, the, the harlot of Babylon. Confusion, spiritual confusion, doctrinal confusion. And the counterfeit Sabbath. Now, the counterfeit Sabbath is Sunday because that is not biblical. But Sunday, as I said, is not yet the mark of the beast because it has not been mandated. These civil penalties have not been attached to it yet. That threefold union hasn't happened yet. There are many sincere believers. But as America turns away from its constitutional principles, and America having worldwide economic influence. And that's a clue. That's a clue to who that beast of the earth is. But again, I'm not going into all the detail. And things change in this world. And that union develops between those two beasts. And again, another clue is, you look at the characteristics of that beast of the sea, and you'll see that they're the characteristics of the little horn in Daniel 7 and 8. And in Daniel 7:25 tells us of that little horn that he would seek to change God's time and law. Well, that change that has been so popular in Christianity to the Sabbath, the only commandment that says remember is not a coincidence. And it will be clearly known by those who hear the fullness and who receive the truth that that Counterfeit Sabbath is a mark of allegiance to that little horn power, to that beast power of Revelation 13, the beast of the sea. People have the opportunity to make the choice between the true and false Sabbath, between the true and false gospel, between the true and false law. They will have the choice but the Sabbath, the Sabbath clearly is the end time issue that we have to consider very carefully. It is a reminder of creation. It is a reminder of six day creation. It is a sign. It is a seal. 
and it will encapsulate these truths of the gospel, of the law of God, and it is visible and it will become more and more apparent to the world who is keeping the Sabbath of God and who is not. It will become more and more a bone of contention. So that, that's some of the things on this belief. I'm going to stop now. And again, you can see more of this in the longer discussion on belief number 20.